So, die hybrid cross. Brought to you by Curious Moranland, where science literacy will make America great. So, I'm going to go through a scenario first. And if you're one of my students, pause this. Um, at the end of these, uh, this little video, I'm going to have some solutions to some homework problems. So, this little chart is not something that you're ever going to have to write out, but I think it helps you see the big picture. When you look at the, this box, you see the number of alleles. So if you have one allele pair, meaning a dominant or a recessive, you're going you're gonna to have four boxes for your Punnett square. You're going to have the maximum number. This is the thing to understand. The maximum number of genotypes would be three. The maximum num gen number of phenotypes would be two, dominant or recessive. Now, dihybrid, the whole purpose of this video, when you have two allele pairs, that means you're going to have 16 boxes. And how do you mathematically you can figure this out? Every time you increase a number here, you take the monohybrid and it becomes an exponent, an exponent, an exponent. So 4 or squared is 16, 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is 4. So you're going to have 9 genotypes. Remember, you can have more genotypes than phenotypes. Look, dominant, dominant, dominant. These are both dominant, and, but one's heterozygous, one's homozygous. That's going to be even more, come into more play here. And so, for example, you can be tall or short in combination with being round or wrinkled. And yes, we will do a tri-hybrid cross where you have three gene pairs, three allele pairs, and it's 64 boxes, 27 different genotypes, and eight phenotypes. So let's go over the rules for doing dihybrid cross. The rules are the same as my monohybrid, except how you split the gametes or show meiosis. So let's do this. You got to assume that you're dealing with separate chromosomes. If you're dealing with linked genes, it's not going to work. And for our problems, assume complete dominance. Now, what do we mean genes on separate chromosomes versus linked? Take a quick look. You see these non-linked genes versus linked? You see these alleles are on different are on different chromosomes from each other. Different chromosomes from each other. These linked genes, that's an allele, that's an allele, that's an allele. So wherever T goes, R goes. Well here, when big T separates from little T, it has no bearing on how big R separates from little R. That's one of the things that Mendel called the uh, law during segregation. He called it the law of independent assortment, meaning these are going to separate and have no bearing on these. So, as usual, identify the alleles, identify the genotypes of the parents. Then, if you saw my monohybrid uh, video, you would have saw I didn't have a step three. It was presumed you know how to separate the gametes. But how do you separate the gametes? Remember, you're predicting possible combination of egg and sperm. That's what a Punnett square does. So, take a look. And notice they're on different, assuming they're on different chromosomes. So you can be tall or short in combination with round or wrinkled. And so what we're going to do, here's the genotypes. Remember, the step was identify the alleles, identify the genotypes of the parents. So that's what we're doing now. We're going to do a heterozygous for both traits times another heterozygous for both traits. This has a familiar pattern, and at the end, I'm going to do an example with that's a parent that's heterozygous times the one that's double recessive, because I want you to know that one as well. So, this is called FOIL. What you need to do is separate the gametes. See, separating the gametes means you have to write out every possible combination. See, big T can combine with big R. Write it down. Big T can also combine with little r, write it down. Little t can combine with big R, write it down. And little t combine with little r. In regards to this, FOIL first, the first one, uh, well, actually, yep. Yeah. <laughs> first, O would be the outer one. I is this one, the inner. And then L, last, Right there. It's you can borrow this from your math class. Notice this is the one time where we will write the lowercase letter 
first because these are independent of each other. Then, so what do you do? If this is the first parent, then you do the same thing for the second parent. Um, just to let you know, it's not always going to be heterozygous, heterozygous for both traits. So you may be do a cross that's homozygous for both traits, homozygous dominant. It would be big T, big R, four times. What if it's homozygous recessive? Little t, little r, four times. So how, what's next? Fill in the Punnett square and list the genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So let's take this parent and put it on the top. And on the side, we're going to put the one written in blue. <clears throat> So this is a chart. Now take a look at this. You notice there's no numbers. There are no numbers. So what I want you to grasp from this is if you look at separating the gametes and you and you see, remember this is half the genes. This parent had has two T's, two R's. But we're, what we're doing is we're writing out every possible cam combination. Each, imagine each one of these being a gamete. Each one of these being a gamete, a possible gamete. So if you look at separating the gametes, and if those become the genes, they reveal what? They reveal what the f nine genotypes and the four phenotypes will be. So that's what we want you to grasp from this. So what we, you can be dominant. Let's write it out. Over here are the phenotypes. Here's the genotypes. Can you have more than one genotype for a phenotype? Here you go. Yes. So you can be dominant, dominant. You can be homozygous, homozygous. Homozygous, heterozygous. Heterozygous, homozygous, heterozygous, heterozygous. Now, you notice there's no numbers. I haven't filled out the Punnett square. I strongly recommend you make a chart of all the genotypes first and the phenotypes that match with each other. These numbers should verify each other. So let's go ahead and look at filling out the Punnett square. Remember, big T moves down, big T moves across, big R, big R. So I don't have time to fill in all these, so I have it filled out. So let's kind of work a little more quickly here. So watch what happens. Now I made it all in red just so you can see the children. Remember meiosis produces the top, meiosis produces the, the bottom. Inside here is what fertilization would be, the offspring. Now remember, this is not 16 children that they have. This is the probability for every one child. Just like you don't have four children for monohybrid cross, you have four possibilities. So what we're going to do next is go back to this, count the numbers, we'll list the numbers here, add them together and right here and when we're done we'll have a genotypic genotypic and a phenotypic ratio so take a look at what what I've circled one two three four right here and then you'll if you go back you'll notice there's two here and then two here and then look totally homozygous only shows up once Look at the other ones. A combination of homozygous, homozygous. Homozygous and heterozygous show up more than totally homozygous, and double heterozygous shows up four times. So let's do the next one. Dominant and recessive. Notice this was dominant, dominant. This is dominant and recessive. Look at the circled blue ones. And again, pause the video at any time to uh, get a bearing for this. OK. One, two, fill it out. Usually, dominant and recessive, or recessive dominant, or should be the same numbers. Here they are in green. One, two, add it together, makes three. And if you add all this together, you have 15. Well, there's only 16 boxes, so this last one has to be one, and here it is right here. Fill it in. So now your genotypic ratio for a heterozygous heterozygous cross is 1, 2, 2, 4, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, or 9, 3, 3, 1, phenotypically speaking. Okay. So 
what if I gave you some word problems and these are the solutions. I'm going to show you the solutions for some of these. This one I'm not really going to talk about, but number two I want you to pay close attention to. So in this particular case, you got some of this double homozygous times uh, heterozygous. Phenotypically, this is a dominant dominant times another dominant dominant. And I drew arrows here, but this is problem number one now. Problem number two, pause the video. Label, here's your one parent and here's your other parent. Notice you need to identify the key. Short and long hair combined with black and brown for a guinea pig. I wrote the genotype here and then here <clears throat> I wrote long brown. Why can I write long brown? Double recessive. So here's pause the video, check and see what you get. I put the heterozygous results on top and the res recessive ones on bottom, or the recessive genotype. Okay, and these are the gametes, 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 gametes. Dominant, 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 recessive, recessive, dominant, recessive, recessive. Four recessives. So pause the video. Now, I'm going to end with showing you the genotypic and phenotypic ratio for a heterozygous for both traits times a double recessive. I expect my students to be able to do heterozygous, heterozygous, plus, which is the 9331, but I also expect them to be able to do other types of crosses, and here we go. There's your results. So I'm going to pause the video and let you uh, check your answers. So here's the setup for solution. So for problem number three, here's the setup and the solution. Of course, you should be doing this first and then checking your answers. And this uh, PDF file will also be loaded on Blackboard along with the video. And for four through six, here's the breakdown. You're gonna use, here's the key ID for numbers four, five, and six. So I'm I'm gonna move over one. So there's kind of example how I didn't fill out the Punnett square, but you can see if this is the parent for this one and this is the parent for that one. Look at the foil produces this. Foil produces this. You don't even need a Punnett square for this one. And five is a heterozygous heterozygous cross. Go back to the original example that I showed you. And six is an interesting combination. I don't have the solution, but I'm showing you how to set get the parents from reading and highlighting this. So they're all tied together. There's absolutely no excuse for not checking your work. And there we go. Brought to you by Curious Marineland. That's how we do Punnett Squares.